<laughs> Hello and good evening. My name is Holger Müller. I'm a professor of physics at the Berkeley Physics Department. And it is my honor to welcome you to this year's annual Emilio Segre lecture. Berkeley Physics has a distinguished history marked by both world-class research and dedication to a public mission of higher education, bringing it to California's citizens. We are proud to be a part of the world's finest public university. Our department has a rich history that includes Ernest Olander Lawrence's invention of the cyclotron giving birth to the field of high energy physics. It includes Robert Oppenheimer, who attracted to Berkeley a generation of theorists. And it includes the person we honor tonight, experimentalist Emilio Segre. Each fall, we celebrate Segre by bringing to Berkeley renowned experimentalists since 1987. These scientists, through their research, have changed the way we perceive the world. Past Segre lecturers included Nobel laureates Bert Richter, Matasoshi Kushiba, Stephen Chu, Hans Bethe, Art MacDonald, Dave Weinland, Rai Weiss, and Taka Kajita. Past lecturers also include Jocelyn Bell, Millie Dresselhaus, Robert Soklo, Zhao Wei Shuang, and the department member and former chancellor, Robert Birgenau. Segre received his doctorate in 1928 from the University of Rome, working with Enrico Fermi. And after two years in the military, he returned to Rome, becoming assistant professor there in 32. In 35, Segre became professor and director of the physics lab at the University of Palermo. Soon after his first visit to Berkeley, Ernest Orlando Lawrence gave Segre a strip of molybdenum that had been irradiated in his cyclotron. In Palermo, Segre and his colleague extracted from that strip a previously unknown and unstable chemical element, technetium. This was the first artificial chemical element. Fifteen years later, technetium was detected in stellar atmospheres, and that proved that stars were generating new elements all the time. In the summer of 38, Segre returned to Berkeley, continued his work, while Mussolini's government passed laws that barred Segre and other Jews from universities. Lawrence offered Segre a position as research associate. Segre accepted and brought his family Son and son from Italy to join him. I'm supposed to flip the slides. Okay, so here is Segre, Fermi, and Persicio. Here's the discovery of technetium. We don't have Mussolini, fortunately. Um, <laughs> Um, with the war depleting the Berkeley faculty, Segre became a lecturer in the physics department, and in 1943, he accepted Oppenheimer's invitation to join the Manhattan Project. At Los Alamos, he headed a group measuring fission rates. He returned to Berkeley after the war. In 55, um, Lawrence and his colleagues designed the Bevatron to produce six GeV protons, an energy sufficient to produce proton-antiproton pairs in collisions with a stationary target. Later that year, the discovery of the antiproton was announced in a paper by Chamberlain, Segre, Wiegand, and Ypsilantis. Here's the antiproton team. Chamberlain and Segre were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1959. Segre continued teaching and research beyond his retirement in 72. Over his five-decade association with the Berkeley Physics Department, Segre trained 30 PhD students, including C.S. Wu, Herb York, Tom Ypsilantis, and Herb Steiner. In 1989, at the age of 84, Segre died from a heart attack while taking a walk in Lafayette, where he lived. He was an avid photographer, and after his death, much of his physics collection was donated to the American Institute of Physics, preserving a record of physics before, during, and after the war. And this year, we are pleased to add Dr. Eric Cornell to the list of Segre lecturers. 
Dr. Cornell is a Bay Area native who remembers seeing the Grateful Dead at the Greek theater. He's currently a professor at Boulder, Colorado and a physicist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. His lab is located at Gillar in Boulder. Eric is an American physicist who, along with Carl Wieman, generated the first Bose-Einstein condensate in 1995. Cornell Wieman and Wolfgang Ketterlich read the Nobel Prize for this discovery. He received his undergrad from Stanford and received his PhD from MIT in 1990. He then joined Carl Wieman at Boulder as a postdoctoral researcher on a small laser cooling experiment. During his two years as a postdoc, he came up with a plan to combine laser cooling and evaporative cooling to create a Bose-Einstein condensate. As some of you might know, might know, Eric's work is very close to my heart. Just like him, I've been working in the field of ultra-cold atoms. And just like Eric, I've been working on testing fundamental laws of physics with ultra-precise measurements. In Eric's honor, I should say, Eric started that before it became as fashionable as it is now. So you're a true pioneer, not just for Bose-Einstein condensation. His lecture tonight, 14 billion years on what can be learned from the original imperfection. His talk will talk about a third and complementary way to find out new things about the fundamental laws of nature, tabletop precision measurement. He will discuss the recent attempt to see tiny differences between the North Pole and the South Pole of the electron. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Cornell. It's conventional to say it's a pleasure to be here, but truly it's a pleasure to be here. I love coming to Berkeley. Uh, something about the campus just makes me happy wandering around here. Every time I come back here, I enjoy myself. I have many family in the Bay Area, and so it's always a multiple function trip. Uh, tomorrow I'll be seeing my mom in San Francisco, um, but today I'm so happy to be here with you talking to you about my uh, uh, recent experiments. Uh, about original imperfection. Um, behold, we are shaped in asymmetry and imperfection that the universe would conceive us. That's actually not what it says in Psalm 51, but somehow it seems appropriate for this topic. So let's go back a few years, 13.7 billion years before this particular Segre uh, lecture, there was a big bang. And then shortly thereafter, as the creation hymn goes, the whole universe was in a hot, dense state. Um, there were electrons, neutrons, protons, sure, but there was also anti-electrons, anti-neutrons, anti-protons, almost exactly the same amount of both, of both the matter and the antimatter. The universe expanded, and as we all learned in high school chemistry, when a gas expands, in this case, the gas that made up the universe expands, it gets cooler. You can tell it's getting cooler because it goes from red to blue and it, gets, it got bigger. And as it got cooler, something very romantic happened. Um, every electron found an anti-electron. Every proton found an anti-proton. Every neutron found an anti. Each particle found its own soul mate. But uh, these relationships were fraught, I would say. Um, and one after another, the protons and antiprotons stuck together, but then annihilated each other, poof, into a hail, leaving nothing behind but a flash of light. Um, and all around the universe, this was happening. In the mass cosmic wedding, uh, there was somebody for everyone. In fact, uh, there was back then, just before all this happened, one billion times more stuff in the universe than there is now, and almost all of it annihilated. And I say almost because if you look around, oh look, there's an electron, there's a proton, there's a neutron, and so this, these are ones that did not find someone to, to connect with. Um, and it turns out that for every billion anti-electrons, there was roughly a billion plus one electrons. For every billion anti-protons, there was a billion plus one protons. And so there were things left over, uh, as you can see. So who are these, these final few lonely particles that no one wanted? Uh, they're you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so what happens then is uh, it's actually really quite fortunate. I mean, it explains a lot, really, doesn't it? <laughs> um, you know, there was a, you know, suddenly 
all but one part in a billion of the, of the material in the universe disappeared, but a few the last few things were remaining. And the electrons and protons stuck together. They did not annihilate, annihilate in that, but in fact, they formed hydrogen, which was the sort of building block of the universe. And uh, what was nearly perfect, this matching up of one billion to one billion and one to one billion was not exactly perfect. It's really, really fortunate that this, this symmetry, this matching up was imperfect. Otherwise, the, the universe would be a very boring place. There'd be nothing but light left over and that would be dull. So uh, of this uh, original imperfection, as I like to call it, we were born. Uh, uh, us, yes, but also stars and universe and the hydrogen stuck together and formed stars. And this is from the James Webb telescope. <clears throat> Such a beautiful image, I had to include it. But uh, this is the result of that and, and us as well. Uh, okay, so how can we learn about this? Because this was an extraordinarily important event. Uh, this, it was roughly a minute or two after the beginning of the, after the, beginning of the universe, an extraordinarily important event that, sh that uh, meant that we're all around, but it's very hard to learn about these things. Um, <clears throat> we can't go back in a time machine. Uh, no one took any written records. How can we look at things that were long ago. Here's a dinosaur. <clears throat> the dinosaurs, um, like the Big Bang, happened before um, Facebook and so on. So it was hard to know, hard to keep a, a running track of these things. Sorry. So uh, the answer to this, I, I like to connect this. Uh, the, the metaphor is a three-legged stool. Um, one leg is is uh, to find out about these ancient is using telescopes and telescope-like things. This is a conceptual picture of a very, very large telescope uh, which collects photons. This is uh, gravity waves. The gravity wave detectors are basically like a telescope, uh, looking at neutrinos coming, basically whether it's real telescopes or t telescope like things that look at things coming from far away, I think of them as telescopes. And what they all have in common is if you look at something which is 10 million light years away, you don't see it the way it is now, you see it the way it was 10 million light years ago. So you're kind of looking back in history. Um, last time I checked, the furthest thing anyone has ever seen, which is this one particular galaxy you, picture, you see pictured here, 13.3 billion years ago. Oh, it's 13.3 billion light years away, which means that when we see it, we see a picture of the universe as, or a part of the universe as it was when it was only a tiny fraction of how old it is today. But that's, it turns out as old as that thing is, it's not nearly far enough to look back to, to ask this question about this original imperfection. Another approach, call it another leg of the stool, is to use particle colliders. You take uh, two particles, oftentimes it's a proton and antiproton, you smash them together with so much energy that when they smash together, they sort of simulate briefly, very briefly, a hot, dense, violent early universe. This is the Large Hadron Collider, and partly in France and partly in Switzerland. It's the largest scientific instrument ever built. Uh, there's supposed to be a person in this picture somewhere for scale, but somehow they're so small I can't even see them. This is a picture of where they collide the particles together. It's the largest uh, scientific instrument ever built, but it appears also apparently not able to address this question. And the next larger machine won't be along for about another 30 years, give or take, or more, and maybe $30 billion or more. So um, there, we need uh, yet a third method. And the third method I want to talk about is uh, well, how do we know about dinosaurs? We see dinosaur bones. We look for fossils. Can we see fossils in the modern day world of the Big Bang, of this in particular, of this moment of this, of this physics where protons and antiprotons didn't exactly uh, match up? Um, and so we're looking for, uh, <coughs> this was an ancient asymmetry a tiny asymmetry between protons and antiprotons. Here's a beautiful symmetric picture, but it's not these kind of symmetries I'm talking about. There are three very physics-y sort of perfections. And one of these is the idea that electrons are very much like anti-electrons, but maybe not perfectly so. The other is that most fundamental particles look exactly the same in the mirror. Most people uh, also, if, if you look at yourself in the mirror, you look very similar. That's not true for all of us. Um, for instance, when I look in the mirror, I see a person who's missing a right arm. It may 
Who knows if this is coincidence or not, but I lost this arm 18 years ago, and it was 18 years ago that I started this experiment. It makes me think a little bit about Ahab from Moby Dick, you know, like <laughs> chasing the white whale, whatever it is. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with these things. Who knows? We don't want to dip too deeply into these Freudian issues. Uh, another ancient, another important physics symmetry is that things look the same if you run the movie backwards. This is not true for if you drop an egg, but like if an electron and a proton bounce off each other and you take a movie of it and you run that movie looking backwards, the movie looks pretty much normal. You can't tell whether you're running it forward or backward. But all of these symmetries aren't perfectly obeyed and uh, they had to be, in particular, this thing about the movie running backward had to be wrong for there to be this asymmetry. So, we have this assumption, and you could call it a hope or a prejudice, that like dinosaur fossils, these fossils won't vanish. Basically, what I want to mean by this is we, want to, uh, we believe that the laws of physics that applied one minute after the universe was born still apply. And what that means is that that asymmetry has to be around today. And the thing is, if you, look at the, if, you look at, if you look at the physics we know about today, we don't actually see that fossil. We don't see in the particles we know about today, in the particle physics we know about today, we don't see enough of this particular kind of asymmetry, the asymmetry known as CP violation or T violation that gives rise to uh, the asymmetry between protons and antiprotons. We don't see it in physics today. What, how, how did that happen? We think we ought to be able to look harder sometimes to find dinosaur bones. You've got to dig a little deeper. So that's what this talk is about. And in particular, we suspect that we'll be able to find this in the electron. Uh, Recton, you can, you can tell the electron is a friendly thing because we talk about him in Comic Sans. Um, it's got a charge of minus one, it's got a mass. A charged particle that spins has a magnetic moment, which means it's got a north pole and a south pole, and usually that's about all you need to know about the electron. And the question is, are the north pole and the south pole the same? On the Earth, they're quite different. You know, the North Pole is sea ice and there's polar bears. The South Pole is mountainous and there's um, penguins, more or less. If ever you happen to see a picture with penguins and polar bears in the same frame, you know exactly where you are. You're at a zoo, right? That's the only, that's the only, place, that's the only place where that ever happens. Um, so the question is, uh, is the North Pole and the South Pole of the electron the same? And in particular, is it possible that the North Pole the, the electron is basically a negatively charged thing, but maybe there's a little bit extra positive charge near the North Pole, a little extra negative charge near the South Pole, or vice versa. And if that were the case, like the positive cancels a little of the negative, and the negative adds to a little of the negative, to the main negative. And if, if, if this were like this, if this is called an electron-electric dipole moment, if it were like this, it would look very much as if the center of the charge of the electron was not exactly in the same place as the center of mass. This is called an electron-electric dipole moment. And it's what we're looking for because if it exists, it has the same kind of asymmetry, the same kind of imperfection that happened way back when. So it's basically a, a fossil and, and it's something which we can study today and, and do theories about today and learn about what happened 13.7 minus one minute ago. 13.7 billion years minus a minute ago. All right. But every time someone's gone to measure this, they find that it's really, really, they, they measure the center of the electron, the charge, and the mass, and they're really quite close to each other. And, and if they, in fact, they don't even see them different. They say, as near as we can, tell, they're in the same place. And if they're not in the same place, they're different by less than 10 to the minus 27 centimeters. I can't even begin to tell you how small 10 to the minus 27 centimeters is. It's hard to say exactly how big an electron is, but some people would say it's about 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. I'm sorry to drown you in the scientific notation, but this ratio, basically what we're saying is, compare the diameter of a virus to the diameter of the Earth. Imagine that the center of charge of the Earth and the center of mass of the Earth. Down there, you got all the way down to the very center of the Earth, and those two, those two centers were exactly in the same place to within the diameter of a COVID virus. That would be not a very asymmetric Earth, and that's what we're talking about. If it's, if it's there at all, it's less than that, so it's hard to look for. What I want to emphasize about this is that, um, okay, so there, this, these new particle physics, um, there's a very long tradition of looking for new particle physics 
in dipole moments. It's just that it used to be magnetic dipole moments. The electron's magnetic dipole moment, we measure it, uh, this is like not, so imagine basically how strong is the magnet that, that electron, electron's got a north pole and a south pole. That's why your, your magnets stick to the refrigerator. And, and it's usually it's measured in these units called the Bohr magneton. And the natural thing you would imagine is that it has, it has one of these, but when they actually measured the mass, uh, sorry, the electric, the magnetic moment of the electron, they discovered it was not one, but two. For its day, this was a precision spectroscopy measurement. They had a very, very precise uh, spectrometer and they saw a line and they applied a magnetic field and the line broke up into two lines. These were, uh, actually extremely sensitive instruments. Uh, actually, the, uh, this kind of spectroscopy was a big thing here in the US before physics was a big thing because we had very good diffraction gratings. There was a clever guy who invented good diffraction gratings here and which kind of got us that, uh, as a country st started down the road of, of precision spectroscopy. Anyway, when they measured this number two and not one, it was a big deal in the particle physics of its day because the Dirac equation, which was the first attempt to connect um, quantum mechanics and relativity. Quantum mechanics and relativity were hard to connect back in the day, it's still kind of hard to connect, honestly. But this was, uh, you know, Dirac came up with this theory and it predicted this exotic thing. And it was, it was confirmed by this experiment using uh, looking at magnetic moments. The next thing that came along, and uh, one of the great things about giving a public lecture is that um, I can say things which are, so I'm not actually a particle physicist. I'm not an, astro, not an astrophysicist. I'm a laser spectroscopist. I'm really sort of a, a oscilloscope, laser wrench, plumber's helper kind of scientist. Um, but uh, here in a popular lecture, I can pretend to be a particle physicist or an astrophysicist, and I can give these thoughts. And, and people um, in the public lecture, if they're in the public, they won't know any better. And my colleagues who are astrophysicists and particle physicists will say, well, Eric really got that wrong, but we'll let him slide because he's trying to simplify things for the public. I'm not trying to simplify things for the public. This is how I understand it. So anyway, but <laughs> and so in particular, I'm going to get my history wrong. But so I'm going to give you a little history, uh, which is basically so the the spectroscopists. I mean, these people who made measurements like this, where they looked very carefully at the the glowing light coming out of hydrogen atoms, they saw this and they thought, oh, great, we can help out our friends who are doing theory of particles and relativity and quantum mechanics, and then. Um, uh, one of these, these theorists said to the uh, spectroscopist, oh, I, I want to tell you something very interesting about the electron. Uh, I'll do this little dial. I'll tell you something very interesting. Oh, what's that? Did you know that when an electron is like, gliding along, every once in a while it just kicks out a photon? The spectroscopist said, no, 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 no. I don't believe you for a second. I took a bunch of elementary physics classes, and if it spits out a photon, that can't conserve energy and momentum. You're just pulling my leg. And the theorist says, no, no, it's really true. It spits out the photon, and then the photon comes back again. It only spits it out for a little while, and then it recollects it again. I'm going to call it a virtual photon. The spectroscopist goes, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. How could that possibly be true? And, and like, how would we ever know? And the theorist says, oh, it's really important, because it spits out all these photons, and when it does, it changes the mass of the electron. And the space process says, changes the mass of the electron, a likely story, just a tiny effect. Oh no, it changes enormously. If it didn't do this, the electron would have a very different mass. And the spectroscopist says, okay, well, what is the, um, what would the mass of the electron would be if it didn't do this? Oh, I don't know. Well, can we make the electron stop doing that so we can compare the two masses? No, we can't do that. So you're saying this has like no experimental consequences. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so the laser, per, the, the, sorry, not the laser, in those days it was the, sp the spectroscopist using the grading. So well, I'm not that interested in it. And the, the theorist said, wait, wait, oh yeah, there's one other thing. You know how like recently you've been measuring these things and you did like an amazingly precise measurement down to 1% and you notice the lines weren't quite right? And that when you measured the, the, uh, the magnetic moment of the electron, it was like 1% different from what it was supposed to be? Spectrophosphorus says, how do you even know that? Like, no, no I, I heard you complaining about it. I can explain that. He says, well, what really happens is this thing that you call a magnetic field, I just think of this magnetic field as like a whole collection of very, very low energy photons. 
And but maybe an electron will spit out a photon. And after it spit out a photon, it'll absorb a photon from your magnetic field. And it will recollect this photon. And as a consequence of that, I'm going to do a lot of math. And you're going to find out that the magnetic moment, make how much the electron wants to interact with that magnetic field, is different by about 1%. OK, well, and they, they did the math. And sure enough, it was like this. And this was the, like a very early test of what's now known as quantum electrodynamics, basically quantum field theory. This was what made people think like, oh, maybe we actually know how to do quantum field theory. And then the theorists said, oh, but, but that's not all. Actually, we can, do, <laughs> we can do four different loops where it kicks out a photon, absorbs a photon. You are like totally kidding me. Well, there turns out to be some hundred thousands of these different, of these different diagrams. And if we do all that, we can predict the magnetic uh, moment of the, of, the, of the electron out to like 10 digits. And it turned out to be right. So basically, I've got, what I want to go with this is like measuring precise things about electrons in the middle of the 20th century was basically how people learned a lot about particle physics. So the question is, can we get still more particle physics if we did like maybe even a better measurement of the, of the magnetic moment? Like instead of kicking out a photon, what if it kicked out some exotic new particle, a virtual particle, just for a little while so it changed the magnetic moment of the electron? And the answer is probably not. The mass of the electron is pretty small. And so these new particles, if they exist at all, are very, very heavy. So it doesn't work so well. Well, um, what about if we use the muon? People may not have heard of a muon. It's a lot like electron, except it's much heavier, which means that, yeah, it talks to heavy particles better. And it, that's true. There's actually an ex a new intriguing result that suggests that maybe you could see this. But the muon is so heavy that it kicks out all these particles, which are called QCD particles, which are gluons and quarks and mesons. And I love these things. I'm not making fun of them. They're just very, very difficult to understand. And it makes it difficult. So it's hard to know whether this, you can find you know, new particles, new exotic new particles that can account for weird asymmetries using these experiments, using the, magne the, the magnetic moment of the muon, just because these particles are hard to calculate with. That's the nice thing why we want to look at electric dipole moments, because all of the existing particle physics we know about would predict that the electron would have a truly fantastically small uh, electric dipole moment, whereas there are many exotic new proposals that explain not only um, the, the electric dipole moment of the electron, but also this initial original imperfection. And so that's what we're about. <laughs> And the, for many, many years, the result was a dude was saying, if, if the electron, electron has an electric dipole moment, it's less than 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27 e centimeters. And that experiment was uh, this idea of like looking thing for things very precisely in, um, in do, looking for these fossils was not a new idea here in Berkeley in particular. And uh, it's very, very much uh, Holger Mueller, as we know, is working on it. Uh, my old quantum mechanics teacher, Carl Van Bibber, was here for many years working on it. I actually took quantum mechanics from Carl Van Bibber. So if, if you, I say anything that's wrong, you should take it up with your senior scientific administration. You know. <laughs> Dima Budker, a professor emeritus here, the late Stuart Friedman. And I want to particularly mention Eugene Cummins, who is a professor here for many, many years, a brilliant guy who I learned, you know, just was a, a very, very inspirational to me. And he um, really led this idea of measuring dipole moments, particularly in electrons, for many years. Uh, so this is now his uh, calendar down here. This is how well, how, how accurately we know that the electric, electron's electric dipole moment is smaller than this number. And you can see that uh, starting in here, starting in the, uh, in the 80s, Eugene Cummins started reduce, increasing this accuracy by, these are like factors of 10 here. So we'll call that the, uh, the Cummins supremacy here, basically. Uh, Something like two decades, or well, what I mean by that is a factor of 100 in the, in the accuracy of the electron electric dipole moment. And two decades, as in 20 years, uh, Cummins sort of stood astride this field. I mean, it was actually kind of intimidating. Like a lot of people didn't want to get into this because no one wanted to compete with him. And at the end of that, sort of towards the end of his career, there was a general sense that you, you can't possibly get into this business by doing what he did because you did it as well as you could do it. And, and since then, the story of, this, of these measurements has been, how can we do it in some very different way? 
Um, so we want basically to do something which was much better than this limit, which is the limit that, that uh, Gene set so many, so many years ago. And we had to do it in some new way. So uh, this is my group working on that. And uh, I should, I, I'll use the first person just because I'm talking here, but uh, for the last uh, 15 years and more, I've been doing this experiment jointly with my, my colleague, Jun Yi. I think he's the world's best atomic spectroscopist. He's certainly a terrific guy, and we've been working on this together for a long, long time. Um, and the senior members of my group uh, in the lab, Tanya Rusi, uh, postdoc uh, Luke Caldwell, Kiabun Ng, have been make, really making the experiments that I'll tell you about work. And I'll just call out Antonio Vigil, who just recently got uh, summa cum laude working as an undergraduate in, in our lab. Uh, and we thank very much our, our, our generous funders. Junyi's graduate students, uh, you can see he's looking very sort of dreamy here. And my students, uh, those, his students tell me that he hates this picture, so I always manage to work it into my talks. <laughs> All right, how can we measure something so very, very small as that? So there's one rule of experimental physics, which if you want to measure something very, very precisely, change what you want to measure into a frequency and measure that. So if you have a clock, for instance, uh, clocks are very, very accurate. What does that have to do with changing things? Well, the, the pendulum goes back and forth. Why is it going back and forth? It's because gravity is pulling it back. Um, it turns out that measuring the frequency of a pendulum swinging back and forth is quite a good way of measuring gravity. If the gravity is stronger, it will tick faster. If gravity is weaker, it will tick slower. And you can make clocks, and this is the point, you can make clocks which are spectacularly accurate, down to like 18 digits of accuracy in clocks which means in principle, anything you can turn into a frequency, you can make very, very precise measurements of. And so that's what we do with electric dipole moments. Um, first, let's imagine how you measure a magnetic dipole moment. An electron, um, tech, typically, if you put it in a magnetic field, it's got a, it's got a north pole and a south pole, and it either points up or points down, corresponds to a difference in energy. And if you shine radio waves at the electron, which are just the right frequency, to take this energy and pop it up here, the electron will flip over. And if you measure the probability of it's flipping over versus the frequency of the radio waves, you see some peak, and that uh, resonance peak. And that resonance peak is right at the product of the magnetic field you apply and the magnetic moment. That's for magnetic moment. Now, if you want to, care, if you care about the electric dipole moment, you just add an electron, electric field to your magnetic field, and you'll shift the resonance. And you can do the experiment twice: once with the electric field pointing along the magnetic field, once with it pointing against it. You measure the difference in those two resonance lines. The magnetic field drops out, and what's left is just the electric field times the electric dipole moment. Conceptually. It could hardly be a simpler experiment, but you've converted into a frequency. This very sensitive thing, you converted from a geometrical thing like center of mass, center of charge. How are you ever going to measure those things? Those are hard to measure. Frequencies we're good at measuring. So that's the point, is you convert geometry, topography into frequencies, and you're halfway there. But you're not, that not well, maybe not halfway, because it's still really hard. <laughs> and what, what makes it hard? Well, how, how if you want to make a really good measurement, what do you want to do? First of all, you want to apply the most humongous electric field you can apply so as to split the lines. Because this number, if it's not zero, it's really small. Then you want to have what's called a long coherence time. Basically, look at the clock ticking for a long time. So you, and if you look at a clock ticking for a long time, you can measure its frequency really well. That makes it, makes it easier to, turn, to, turn, to tell those two frequencies apart. And then you want to watch the electron flip over many, many times because then you can average and, and you can find the center of these resonance lines really, really well. You get a figure of merit. Big electric field, big coherence time, lots of electrons flipping over within some limited amount of time, say the lifetime of a graduate student, some finite, <laughs> finite unit of, not lifetime, graduate career of a graduate student. Although some people say they feel like they've been in graduate school their whole life. So, um, so big problem. You want to apply a big electric field to an electron. You all learned what happens if you apply a big electric field to a charged particle. It goes zoom, flies away. So there was a guy named Pat Sanders who figured out what to do with this. You actually take the, instead of using a bare electron, you use an electron which is already attached to an atom. And it turns out for some complicated relativistic reason, having a very, very heavy atom with lots of protons in it makes the effect larger. So we do that. The other thing to get a really big electric field is you, uh, you use a molecule. 
it was actually the last time I took chemistry, I was in high school, but the one thing I learned about is some molecules stick together because they have a positive atom and a negative atom. And you can imagine that right in the spacing between a positive and negative atom, there's really big electric fields. And that's what we do. So in the spacing between what for us, we use a fluorine, which is a very negative atom, and hafnium, which is a very heavy atom, right in between here, the electrons experience this extremely large electric field. All we have to do is apply a very small electric field, just a few volts per centimeter, and it will make the molecules uh, stand up straight. And then in the laboratory, the electrons feel a much larger electric field, such as there is between the molecules. So it's kind of like multiplying the, mag the electric field by a factor of a billion by going from, by using molecules, which is a big, big win for us. We use an ion trap, our molecules are charged, and these are supposed to represent electrodes. I'll show you a picture of the electrodes, but we put electric voltages on them, and the fields from the voltages push the molecules in and keeps them sort of confined to the center of this trap. And, um, but you might think, okay, but the thing about, the thing about working with, um, in an ion trap is that you've got all these electric fields which are pushing the ions around and the electric fields are changing and there's weird magnetic fields. How, how could you possibly do a precision measurement in the middle of there? And to do that, we use the molecules. Uh, the molecules have a wonderful property, which is um, the molecules we use, this sort of represents how, how, what direction the molecules are spinning in. The molecules we use uh, come um, in pairs of, of what are called parity pairs, parity doublets. With, uh, with them arranged sort of symmetrically with the molecule pointing up and down or anti-symmetrically with them pointing up and down, positive or negative parity. If we apply an electric field, these things, just a few volts per centimeter, these, the, the natural states, what are called the energy states, the eigenstates, the molecules, become states of the molecules pointing along the electric field or against the electric field. And then we apply a little magnetic field to, to separate out these energies. And then if there's an electron in there, uh, uh, feeling the big electric, the electron spin feels the big electric field in there. And you can see that this energy difference is slightly different from this, this energy difference. If we measure those two frequencies and take the difference, everything cancels out. The magnetic field in the lab, the, the electric field in the lab. Well, the only thing that's left is the big electric field inside the molecule and the dipole moment. So it's sort of a way of canceling out all the noise, all the garbage, all the things we don't care about by doing a differential measurement. Yes, measuring a frequency, but measuring two frequencies that if we subtract them, all the junk cancels out and only the thing we care about is left. But we do need to apply a, uh, an electric bias field, a bit, a, basically an electric field to the molecule to make it stretch out in the laboratory. And you know, if you, if you have an ion in an ion trap and you apply an electric field to it, it will fly out. So like here's, a, here's our molecule, hafnium and fluorine. We apply electric field that will stretch it out nicely, but you need to check this out. Ready? Foosh. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is, this is really advanced PowerPoint skills. We're gonna do that again. Yeah, so that doesn't work. So how can we apply the electric field in the lab to this ion? And it turns out we can take a trick from people who make heavy ion storage rings. Here's that same uh, accelerator, right? or a, a, a heavy, heavy, a, a large accelerator. The ions travel around this huge circle, and basically everywhere along here, there's a magnetic field pointing into the screen, and as the molecule goes zooming around, that magnetic field causes the, uh, the, sorry, causes the heavy ion to go around in a circle. From the heavy ion's point of view, it's kind of as, as if there's an electric field always pointing in. So if we were to do an experiment like this, the ion would constantly feel an electric field, but it wouldn't go very far. Or at least it would be trapped inside this huge ring here. So I thought, well, this is a great idea, and we can do it in Boulder. Here's Boulder. There are the mountains. Recently, we had a snowfall. And so uh, this is about the same scale. And, I, and so I went to the... Uh, I went to the chancellor, actually. Uh, if, I, if I had gone to, to, to Bob Bergino, he, he totally would have said yes. But I, I went to the chancellor, I said, listen, I've got this great idea, it's gonna, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be Nobel Prizes galore, and we're gonna build this big ring. And uh, the chance, uh, chancellor said, well, yeah, but looks like we'd have to tear down the football field. I said, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, but he didn't think that was funny. And he said, no. And I said, well, I could scale it down, no. I said, well, what if we just put it on the lawn outside of Jill? I said, I could, there's this grassy space just outside of the building. I could totally build a big ring there and only cost $30 million. He said, no. So then we built a really tiny storage ring. And we'll have to zoom in to see the scale. Yeah, it's a millimeter across. <laughs> so that's the one we built. It was a little bit of a letdown, but OK. Um, and it's actually not really a storage ring at all. We just apply a rotating electric field. And it rotates in such a way that before we apply electric field, before the molecule has a chance to go anywhere, we've rotated the electric field around so it's pointing the other direction. It keeps rotating around. And the molecule travels around in a circle about a millimeter across. So it's the world's smallest heavy ion storage ring. But it, it rotates, the electric field rotates around rapidly enough that it tra traces out a very small circle but slowly enough that the molecule stays aligned locally in the electric field, we just have to do this spectroscopy in the rotating frame. But at any given moment in the laboratory, everything's all lined up. We had to learn how to do that, but it wasn't too bad. This is what the experiment actually works like. Uh, for scale, there's a pair of needle nose pliers. Uh, there's eight separate fins, which are made out of, out of uh, titanium. And the spacing between them is about 20 centimeters, no, about 10 centimeters, excuse me. Uh, and we, one by one, we make each one alternately positive and the, the opposite one negative. So it causes the electric field to rotate around. And we drive that around, turns out about almost a million times per second. And the electric field goes spinning around and around. And the ions are trapped in the middle. We apply other electric fields whose purposes are to keep the ions kind of right halfway in between all the different fins. Uh, how do we, so we, we want to watch it there. We want to listen to it go tick, tick, tick and measure the frequencies. How do, we, how do we make it tick? How do we listen to it tick? We use lasers. Here, because this is a public lecture, I'm going to skip a few things because we use 10 lasers. And each laser is really, really important. My students, it used to be that the students would name the lasers after X's. Uh, and, and the lasers were always sort of, it was very sort of personified. Like it was like the, the, this laser exemplified this particular unsympathetic trait of some former partner. And that just got to be too edgy. And so we stopped doing that. And now we, we still use sort of a sort of, uh, we sort of reify the lasers, but now they're all named after uh, animals from the Chinese zodiac. So we have like rabbit and horse and cow and so on. The cow is a really big laser, you know? And, and eventually we got to a point where we actually had two we got to a point where one time we had 11 lasers. Uh, we, we, we actually had more than 12 lasers. They weren't all in use at any given time. So we started to invent lasers which seemed, you know, we have both sheep and goat. You know, we have mouse and hamster, you know? <laughs> so we got, but it, it got very, very complicated. I'm not going to tell you a lot about it, but we do um, make the molecules right in sight. We, 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 Right, we can't, you can't buy these molecules from a chemical company. We actually make them inside of our vacuum chamber. We, we shine a laser and we, we evaporate some hafnium and we combine it with, we make to do the chemistry. We combine it with sulfur hexafluoride. We make hafnium fluoride. It travels into the center of our trap. We ionize it with lasers and we trap them in here. We do many, many lasers to adjust the internal states and, and get the molecules just where we need it to. It's kind of complicated, so I'm going to skip over a few steps here. Oops, there's some more good steps. Yep, I'm going to skip over those two. Uh, the room is a giant room uh, full of a very, very large number of lasers, and they all shine into a spot way back there. And inside a little vacuum can there is, is, the, is the experiment I showed you earlier. We, have, we use various sorts of tricks, which I'm, again, I'm going to gloss over a little bit. but. Uh, again, where we're doing differential measurements, we measure one frequency, which is about 100 hertz. The another frequency, uh, which is, has the opposite sensitivity to the electron's electric dipole moment, is about 100 hertz plus or minus 30 or 40 microhertz. So it's, it's very, very similar frequencies. These very small frequencies are what we're trying to measure. Um, let's see if we got here. We do something called Ramsey spectroscopy, which means we start by preparing all of the, of all, all of, we well, have two samples of molecules. One sample of molecules is pointing down, one sample of molecules is pointing up. These two samples of molecules are both in our trap at the same time, all swimming around together. So they occupy exactly the same space in the trap and we measure at the same time, which means that many of the sort of errors 
that would confuse us. Like maybe the magnetic field is changing over the time. Maybe the electric field is not always exactly the same. These errors tend to cancel out. We uh, take some of the population and put them over here. We let it wiggle back and forth a little time, and then it wiggles back and forth at the frequency of the clock ticking, tick, 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 about 100 times per second. Then we get rid of all the atoms over there, goodbye. And these molecules are actually all overlapping, but some molecules are pointing one direction, some molecules are pointing the other direction. When we hit with them with a laser and they fly apart, we break them apart and they fly apart in different directions. And then just the hafnium ions, we accelerate them onto a detector and we see two separate clouds of ions. I realize I'm skipping a few steps here. I'm kind of trying to give you a flavor. Don't worry if this doesn't fully make sense. We see two separate clouds of ions which correspond to the molecules that we're pointing down or the molecules which we're pointing up. And if we see a large population, that corresponds to a tick. If we see a small population, that corresponds to a tock. As we go, as, as time goes by, the, these things wink on and off. These things wink on and off. We measure tick tock, tick tock, and we plot them. This is the upper population going tick, tock. Here are the lower population going tick, tock. This is right at the beginning, 1500 milliseconds later, one and a half seconds later, they're still going tick, tock, tick, tock. We know how many tick tocks we missed in between here. There was just 100 times one and a half seconds. So 150 ticks and tocks in between there. And we can fit that to a particular frequency and we can extract the frequency of the ticking and talking very precisely and we can compare those two frequencies and it's the difference that tells us about the electron electric dipole moment all right i seem to um I'll, we spend a lot of our time trying to understand if we've made any mistakes um, because it's really easy to mess these experiments up so we'll do things like put the molecules on the trap and we'll apply a little extra positive voltage on one side, a little extra negative voltage on the other side. And then we can move the molecules from one side of the trap. They're basically in the center of the trap. The trap is 10 centimeters across. We'll move them like half a centimeter one, half a centimeter one way, half a centimeter the other way, a couple centimeters, maybe half a centimeter up and down. We'll measure various frequencies inside there. And ideally, these all should be exactly the same, but we learn about what's going on and we, and we were able to interpret all of these different um, frequency shifts and use them to understand about any possible imperfections, any spatial inhomogeneities, any, any, any problems with our electric or magnetic fields. Eventually we come to understand just about everything that's going on inside our trap. That's what we spend a lot of our time doing. Um, there are two, currently there's, uh, for the last 10 years or so, there have been two leading experiments. One is called JILA which is us. One is called ACME. They're the competition. We love them, but they're the competition. <laughs> so when I say ACME, it's okay if you, if you hiss. It's like, no. <laughs> Actually, there may even be several people who are graduates of ACME here in the audience, so we really do love them. But they are, after all, our competition. Uh, and over the years, we in many ways do our very similar experiments. We use a heavy metal fluoride molecule. They use a heavy fluoride, metal fluoride molecule. We both have, very, therefore, very large electric fields. <clears throat> we use ions, which are relatively easy to trap. But because the ions don't like to be close to each other, we, we, don't have, we can't count very many ions. The ACME people use neutral molecules, and they can, which you can jam a lot more neutral molecules together. And so they count many more molecules than we do. We use a trap, so we have a very, very long coherence time. They, they sit in the trap for more than, up now up to about three seconds. Acme has a beam line, so they look for it only for maybe a thousandth of a second. So they have much broader resonances, which is not so good, but they have much better signal to noise. Given how different all these things are, it's surprising how very similar our results are. We have to work at a rotating frame of reference, which is complicated, and, and the Acme people don't have to do that. Um, Coming soon from around the country, there are other experiments which are going to use trapped neutral molecules. And basically those new experiments will be combining the best of both worlds, but they're still several years away. Last time we looked at this plot, we saw the, the Cummins supremacy here where, they, where for roughly 20 years uh, he, held, he held the record. Uh, uh, a group from Imperial College, originally led by, by Ed Hines, really were for a long time leading the way on using, this is like the first of the molecule experiments. And they actually made a small improvement uh, by middle of, uh, I guess this was just after 2012 or something like that, just ever so slightly better than uh, Gene's, Gene's measurement. 
Then along came ACME, uh, the Harvard Yale group. It's no longer the Harvard Yale group, it's the Harvard Northwestern Chicago group. Professors have a way of, of shuffling around. And uh, they did a factor of 10 better. Uh, then along came Jill and this. We were just about uh, the same. And these two measurements together, it looks at 10 to the minus 28. But what I want to make clear is that it's not that we measured the electron electric dipole moment to be 10 to the minus 28 centimeters. We actually measured zero. We said it's zero plus or minus 10 to the minus 28 centimeters. So this is a limit, not a measurement. And, but it was a limit which was such a good limit that it had a, a very, uh, you might say, I mean, it had a very sinister effect because at the same time as Harvard and Yale were setting these limits, the Large Hadron Collider was looking for all sorts of new exotic new particles called supersymmetric particles, and they didn't see anything. And so together, the Harvard and the Harvard Yale group and this group were sort of accessories to the murder of what was known as the minimal supersymmetric model of particle physics, may it rest in peace. But for a long time, this was a very popular idea. There was no experimental evidence for it, but it was still very lovely. Um, now there's you know, considerable experimental evidence against it. Um, so uh, that was fine, but uh, still didn't solve this problem of maybe, okay, maybe we don't have supersymmetry, but we still have this problem of what happened to this asymmetry in the, in the very beginning of the universe. The Harvard-Yale group added another factor of 10, which really was, uh, really felt like we had to get going. <laughs> so uh, we recently have finished an experiment, uh, which is now even a little bit better than that. And I, um, in order to, we took 600 hours of data and we took that data blind. What that means is, as we collected the data, we told the, the computer to lie to us, take all the numbers and add like a random number and don't tell us what the random number is. The reason we did this is that we didn't want to fool ourselves. There's something of a tradition in the precision metrology world of people fooling themselves and being over, overly influenced like, people would be measuring the, the charge of an electron. This is you know, through the 20th century, the measure charge of an electron. All these measurements were, you know, they were done by different groups. Probably they were a little, it's possible, we don't know, but they may have been influenced. This line shows the current value. They may have been influenced by these previous values and sort of afraid to make a measurement which was too different. I don't know. Anyway, at some point it popped over. Similarly, massive electron. Someone made it much, much better, but you know, maybe they were a little shy about going to what's now known to be the right value. These, these sort of trends in experiments aren't necessarily evidence that people were sort of sociologically influenced, but they're but they're they're not, but they they definitely suggest that. It's not that. Physicists are dishonest people. I, for instance, am a very, very, very honest person, but I'm also a person, a human being. And, you know, human beings want things, they're influenced, and like measuring a non zero electric dipole moment would be a very big deal. It would be a huge thing in my, in my career, finally amounting to something, you know, that'd be good. So that's the sort of, th that's the sort of thing that, like, you know, influences people. And so you can say, well, I'm not going to be influenced by that. But then you could like, the, what's very easy to do is to be so committed to not influence, letting that influence you that you go the other way, right? And so it's very, very hard to find, like not to allow something to push you one way or the other. But if you tell the computer, just straight lie to me, okay? Don't tell me what the number is. Then you collect all the data and you can look at the data and based on other things about the data, like how well the apparatus was working that way or how well it wasn't working, you can include the data in your final average or not without being influenced by the number. So we took, um, 600 hours of data, and it takes much more than 600 hours of data to take 600 hours of data because the machine only works on really good days. This took many months to collect all of these data, and these aren't uh, this. We subtracted the the average from it because we don't actually know what the average is. But you can see the data follow this very beautifully smooth symmetric thing, just the just the width you might anticipate. We th we spent a lot of time studying the systematic errors, and we think the systematic errors are are pretty small, but the central value is still blinded. Oh, wait a minute, the central value is not blinded. It was blinded until four days ago. So four days ago, we looked at the answer. <laughs> I have something to confess. I really, really, really wanted to come to the Segre lecture, the, the University of Gene Cummins, and to tell you the answer. And I actually know the answer. 
But the problem with doing an experiment this large is that you have colleagues. We call them collaborators. And we all got to vote about when we were announcing it. And I feel as the senior person on this experiment, I should get to decide that. Wouldn't you think so? <laughs> and since I want to tell you, I should tell you? Yeah, that's what I thought too. I was outvoted. Um, and um, this is a, the price you pay for doing physics as a sociological activity. Everyone else said, what well, we really should do, what would be better is if we wait till we finish the paper and we've submitted the paper, and then we'll go ahead and we'll put it on archive and that will be the right thing to do. And they're right. It's just that I wanted to come here and tell the answer. And um, well, there it is, but I can't tell it to you. <laughs> but we can tell. But I can tell you. But I can tell you what it might be. This, by the way, is the um, the Acme measurement. This is the 2018 uh, our, our collaborator. Our, sorry, our competitors' measurement. They measured in units of electron centimeters four plus or minus ten to the minus thirty uh, e centimeters. Remember, the Gene Cummins limit was ten to the minus twenty-seven. So this is like more than two hundred times better. Uh, it's traditional in this business, if you get a measurement like this one, which is more or less consistent with zero, you report the answer as consistent with zero, but then you add sort of absolute value error bars saying, we think the absolute value is less than, and they said less than 11 times 10 to the minus 30. Okay, so on this plot, um, our error bars are more than a factor of two smaller. I can't tell you exactly where that dot is, but I can tell you the error bars are much smaller. And I just, just want to review with you, like, what are some possibilities? Like, it could be it's right around here. And if it were, that would be very interesting, right? Because we could put, uh, we, could, we could associate with that a smaller upper limit. It's be smaller by more than the factor of two than this. And there are theorists who are trying to explain the original asymmetry that, you know, was responsible for us. And a consequence of almost every time a theorist tries to explain that, he or she ends up predicting a particular value for the electron-electric dipole moment, which depends on their particular theory. So if we measure this, a smaller error bar, we can use it to murder theorists. I mean, not theorists, <laughs> theories. And, and murdering theories is what we're all about, right? That's, that's, that's like, I, 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 I murder a theory in the morning. I'm set for the day. I feel great. <laughs> um, so that would be good. Or we could measure this number. This would be an interesting number, about eight. Uh, eight's interesting, because, or nine, say, because it's in reasonable agreement with the ACME folks. The ACME folks will say, yeah, we, we believe your number. But because the error bars are smaller, because it's shifted over this way, it would be four standard deviations away from zero. Very, very unlikely to be a statistical error. It would be a big deal, right? Or we could measure minus eight. Which would be a, this would be a touch awkward because, yes, it would be four standard deviations away from zero, but it would also be really, really far away from ACME. The ACME group, and we, we would have to have many, many heart-to-heart -heart conversations about, about this. It would be, it would be. So, and it's, um, the answer is one of those. <laughs> uh, but, uh, just in case, and as a way of hedging our bets, whichever one of those it is, we'll definitely want to make a better measurement. You know, um, we'll want to have smaller error bars, uh, either so we can know the non-zero value more accurately and also have it be better and better, more and more strong statistical evidence, or, uh, or we want to have smaller error bars because we want to overwhelm the skepticism which we might encounter from the ACME people, <laughs> or because we want to have a smaller limit. Well, we definitely want smaller air bars after this. So we're, we've already started on the next generation experiment. This is the group working on the next generation experiment. Uh, and you can see it's a monstrosity. Every, four, every time you count four of these little circular chunks of metal here, that's a separate trap. So we're going to do the experiment on like 15 times in parallel. So we're bringing in parallel processing if you want to think about it like this. So it's going to be, we're going to have much better statistics. Uh, the ions are going to actually be shuttled along here into a region of very low magnetic field and low temperature where we'll get longer lifetimes. It's going to be a marvel. It's going to be great. Um, and it's already being assembled. We had an extremely tense moment when we constructed the whole thing and slid it inside the vacuum chamber. This was like, we had huge arguments about what's the right amount of coffee before you do something where if you drop it, it's going to set you back six months. Some people said a lot of coffee. Some people said not too much coffee. So some people were like visibly trembling and other people were almost falling asleep. But we got everything inserted in there. 
it's working. We've seen our first, when instead of using hafnium fluoride, we're using an even heavier molecule, thorium fluoride, and we've discovered, we've detected the thorium atoms and the, fluorine, the, the thorium fluoride molecules and the thorium atoms around the outside after the photodissociation effect. And we've started to use lasers to cool the rotational temperatures. This is for my friends in the AMO physics community. We're using lasers to rotationally cool. This, this was these J equal one, J equal two, J equal three. We cool the J equal two molecules when we turn on sheep. That's a, a member of the Chinese zodiac. It's, but also it, it moves the population over, over here. So things are coming along. Um, we hope that experiment will be yet another factor of five or so better, but it won't be around, it won't be finished for several more years. Meanwhile, we're hoping, as I, as I explained, we're hoping to understand uh, this original asymmetry uh, and contribute to a third leg of the stool, um, uh, which, is, which includes telescopes, accelerators, and uh, precision measurement. And with that, I, I thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to answer questions. I wasn't kidding. I would be filled to answer questions. And uh, there are particularly be very happy to answer questions of uh, students or younger people or not even professors. Like there is no such, I'm, I love questions which are totally off the wall. So I'd be thrilled. Well, from all of us, thank you, Eric, for the lecture. Yeah, who wants to ask the first question? Yes. Over there. So um, what are the chances that uh, so what are the odds that there actually is um, symmetry in the matter and antimatter, but there's just some like spatially separated cluster of antimatter sitting somewhere in the universe? Oh, there's a really interesting question. Um, the odds of that are, if uh, the, so the idea is like, well, maybe just in the part of the universe we can see, or, or like, one thing I can tell you is that it's, um, in the, we think of stars as being quite distinct from each other and galaxies as being quite distinct from each other, but there's interstellar and even intergalactic dust. And if one star was made of matter and the next star over was made of antimatter, the dust that came off of one star would fall onto the other star and we'd see the annihilation events happening. We'd see flashes of gamma rays coming, even between galaxies. So what we know is that all of the galaxies we can see, because we see one galaxy, we see the next galaxy, we see the next galaxy, we never see flashes of gamma rays, you know, intense gamma rays coming from the boundaries. So we know that everything we can see, and we can see out to about 14 billion light years is the same stuff. Now, well, 13.5 billion light years. Long. So it could be that right next to that, there's another chunk of universe, which is all antimatter and so on. Yeah, we can't, I can't rule that out. Um, that's possible, yeah. All I can tell you, all we can really do is talk about the universe that we're our sort of, the universe that we have any chance of ever seeing. We're never gonna see that part of the universe. That's, that's flying away from us too fast. How about the next question? Yes. Please start. How does the, the um, um, hold on, um, Sarah has a microphone for you. How does the asymmetry, the original asymmetry, compare between protons, electrons, and neutrons? Like, was it all the same one in a billion, or is there like variations between them? No, uh, there were not variations. Okay, neutrons are another story, but protons and electrons, um, we uh, we know that the number of protons and neutrons, and the protons and electrons are very, very, very precisely the same number because the universe is not charged. If the universe were charged, crazy things would happen. So even back before when there was a billion and one and a billion and one, even back there the universe was neutral. So um, that part, if, if, it's, if it was a billion and a billion and one protons, then it was a billion and a billion and one electrons too, that, to quite to much higher precision than that, to many more digits than that, yeah. It's a neutral universe. Here's a question in the front. Here comes a microphone.
So sorry to get in so late. I was working the election. Um, what is your best bet for whether it's tabletop or not, which um, are particles, and it may be covered, may have been covered, uh, are the best candidate to looking in the mass spectrum for uh, uh, dark matter? Are they, what do you think, of, specifically, what do you think of the tabletop, very light axions? And okay, so the question has to do with dark matter, which is uh, not what this talk was about, but which is a super, super interesting talk in, in astrophysics and cosmology. Uh, we know that when we see galaxies, well, there's various different ways we know that most of the matter in the universe isn't even protons, isn't even electrons. It's something else altogether, something which gravitates because we see the galaxies spinning around each other faster than the galaxies would spin around each other than if, if they were just made up of hydrogen atoms, if they were just made up of ordinary stuff. Uh, so it's quite clear that there's dark matter. It's also quite clear that no one knows what it is. The question was, me, little Eric, what's my best guess for what the dark matter is? And I don't know. I really don't know. I, um, I am a humble molecular spectroscopist. <laughs> and uh, this is, I, you know, I love to think about these things, but my understanding, I mean, you might not tell it from my talk. I hope you can't tell it from my talk. But my understanding of many of these things is kind of at the scientific American level. Really, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I don't think that anyone else. It's a great question. And, I, and um, there are many, many different experiments around there looking for it. But I would not want to be the person who has to handicap those experiments for the betting line in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and the front? There's, there's one over there. So my question is, could we look at this sort of a symmetry for other non-elementary particles like quarks with fractional charges? Um, okay, yeah, so the, about this asymmetry for, for things with fractional charges, we, it's hard to see the asymmetry is a thing with fractional charges because we can't see the things with fractional charges. <laughs> uh, it's uh, the, the nature of things that uh, these fractional charges are confined, and so, um, that into what are called uh, you know hadrons, right? They're basically protons and neutrons, and and those things all stuck together, and so that's kind of what we're it's kind of what we're stuck with. There are there are other particles like um, you know mesons, which are like one 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 uh, two quarks stuck together, and that's allowed, uh, but they don't live very long, uh, and so it's very hard to say much about them just in, at the precision level. Uh, there are things beyond electrons like muons or tau particles, they also don't live very long. So the things that stick around long enough to measure are, um, well, people have tried to do this on muons. Neutrons, people, uh, there's an extensive effort to look for electric dipole moments in neutrons. Uh, that actually predates even the measurements of, of, uh, of electric dipole moments, um, going back to the days of Norman Ramsey and continuing even now. And I didn't talk about it just because it's a whole other field, motivated by very similar, well, these similar, these same considerations, just in a different sector. People also look for dipole moments and various CP violating physics in, in larger atomic nuclei, like the, the mercury nucleus and the, the radium nucleus and things like that. Uh, experiments which have a lot in common with these, but then also a lot different. Um, but they address a lot of the same physics. Uh, and it's nice to have all of these things going on. It would be nice if all of them came up with some non-zero values because you could put all of that together and actually start to tell a coherent story about what's going on with the physics. Of course, it would also be nice to see a whole zoo of new particles coming out of accelerators. But that really, no joke, that could be, I say 30, but that's probably would be the optimistic number years away. Um, it's, it, it takes a long, long time to find the money for them and build them. And there's a significant chance that they will never will be, that never will build another big one. That's just a, yeah. Eric, um, are there any other manifestations of an electron electric dipole moment other than this asymmetry? Like, could there be something in solid state physics or some other manifestation? Yeah, well, if, if, it were, if it were really big, you'd start to see like interesting effects in atomic spectra. Like, you know, just like things would change, but it's not that big. Um, this is not exactly what you asked, but it gets at what you asked a little bit. There are people, uh, I think particularly Larry Hunter and, and Amherst College, who have tried to look for these inside solids. 
because solids can have magnetism. They can even have something much like magnetism, sort of ferroelectric effects inside, which can exaggerate uh, these things. And so it could pass, and you would get enormous signal to noise. The problem with solids, are there any condensed matter physicists in the audience? <laughs> this is really, this is, this is a little delicate. Um, See, so I'm an atomic physicist, I'm a molecular physicist. Solids are, are icky. <laughs> They're full of like dirt and impurities and crystal dislocations and all of these things break symmetries. And that doesn't mean you can't do this kind of physics in solids, but you just have to be very careful to do it. So for instance, Larry Hunter, an extremely talented scientist, wasn't able to make that work. So for tests of some of these symmetries, solids aren't perfect. On the other hand, they bring you Avogadro's number worth account rate. And so that's a huge trade-off. And so if you could figure out how to solve that, I know that there's a group in, in Canada which is um, taking, uh, building their own designer solid out of frozen neon, um, and in, in which is, or frozen argon, I can't remember, one of those, and which makes it, we can make a very beautiful pure solid and putting, putting things into it and using that to study uh, Again, electron electric dipole. I know it's not exactly your question. Your sort of question is more like, well, what would be the cool things that happen in the regular world, maybe, if the electron had electric dipole moment? And the answer is it's already so small that the answer is like no, nothing really, I think. <laughs> Here's a question. Please. Here we go. It seems strange to me from your kind of your first slide that there's this one uh, extra uh, proton and antiproton and so on. There's, there's an asymmetry. Why did it favor matter or is that just nomenclature? It's just nomenclature. Um, it's only nomenclature. What we call matter is the stuff that's left over. Absolutely, there's no reason why we couldn't call, we, there, it would be perfectly reasonable to say the entire universe, universe is made of antimatter and not matter. You know, it was kind of like, think of Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he figured out there was two different kinds of charge and he had to call one positive and one negative. And ever since then, we've done that. He could have flipped it around and it probably would have been better, honestly, because you know electrons are much more important than protons and every, most everything around. See, I'm showing my biases, but electrons really are much more important than protons. They should be the positive ones, but it's too late. Um, and it does seem reasonable to me that, um, that as people, we would call the stuff that we live in, the good stuff and everything else, the anti-stuff. I mean, it's... <laughs> Okay, now that, another, another follow up naive question. Yeah. If we've been left with this one in billion uh, uh, anti proton and an electron, do they annihilate? No, they don't. Um, well, you know, an anti. Uh, an antiproton electron, it's even hard to get them close together because they're, they're both negative. Um, uh, but if you, even if you could get them hard, close enough together, they don't annihilate. Uh, electrons, because there's, um, there's these various quantum numbers that are conserved. So even if you could like get an electron to smash into an antiproton, I guess you can do that actually. They don't, they, you might cause the antiproton to break up into little fragments of antiprotons, but no, it wouldn't annihilate. Okay, last question. Suppose you'd had some anti-neutrons anti yeah. left. Yeah. Can you make a, a nucleus out of anti-neutrons uh, and protons? Um, oh, that is a really interesting question. My belief, um, there's gonna be some particle physicists here who are gonna laugh at me. <laughs> Damn, I hate when they laugh at me. Um, can I answer a different question instead? <laughs> a different question instead is what, what you people can do and have done is taken anti-electrons and anti-protons and stuck them together. You're saying, yeah, this is old hat. Stuck them together to make anti-hydrogen. And that was super cool. They did that in CERN, um, so, which is not exactly your question. So people have made anti-hydrogen and in principle, they could stick that all together and make you know, anti-water or anti-whatever, but it would be difficult. I don't actually, 
I have my guesses, but I hate to say wrong and stupid things. I'm not sure whether you could get an anti-neutron and a positive, a, a, a proton, and make that some sort of hybridized deuterium, sort of neither anti nor, nor, nor neither anti deuterium nor deuterium. That's a great question. I have my guesses, but I think I want to keep them to myself. Saying, I like, think I love the question, don't know the answer. A couple of people in the back have been waiting for oh, a while. Yeah, please, whoever, uh, I can't, I, I see somebody here, I see someone way back there. And then we'll come here. Keep raising your hand, we'll get back I to you. I think the gentleman with a mask in the back has been I'm waiting for I'm not a for physicist, okay. <laughs> so I don't un understand most of what you said. Oh, I'm but sorry But I'd that. like to ask you this question. Yeah. <clears throat> you, it's a either or or both. Either or what both. Do, what is it about what you've just described that's important to me in my life, or what is it that's what is it that's important in your life in the advancement of the physics? Where does this fit? Does this fit on the practical scale, my life, or okay, does it so, fit in theoretical stuff? Yeah, I mean, there are multiple different answers. I'm gonna give you like three different answers. Um, as many as you got. Yeah, uh, I, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, what this will never do is like help you design a better transistor. Like there's a lot of things that physicists do that will help you make a better, this doesn't happen to be one of them. Um, it's just too small an effect to be particularly relevant to like commercially useful things. That said, I myself would, I don't know if I want to say I would find comfort or just interest or just, I would love to know. To me, it seems, this, to me, it seems like an important question, a question I'd like to understand just as a person, this particular question. I'll say that. I'm, and doesn't necessarily my, 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 left, my, my, my life better or worse. I just find these sorts of things interesting and like helping understand why we're here at some level. Um, but there's another answer that I want to give you, which is, um, why should, why should we pay for it? Um, it's, uh, these experiments are much, much cheaper than building an accelerator, but that doesn't mean they're actually cheap. Um, that lab I showed you had three quarter million dollars of lasers in it. And if you pay taxes uh, out here in the audience, then you bought them, and I thank you. Um, actually, some of them came from foundations. So some cases it was bought by, uh, very rich people who have passed away and were generous, but um, those are foundations. But, other, but a lot of the money came from taxpayers. And that I have a very specific answer for. I know why the government wants to fund this. And it's because, um, it's not because of the answer, but it's because of the, 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 what people have to do to get the answer. Basically, the students in my lab who can answer these problems are students who could do just about any freaking technological thing you could possibly name. These are very, very, very difficult experiments. The my students who can do these things are all around technological badasses. When they graduate, they are hired, they are in, in very enormous demand into this country's high-tech industry. In particular, these days, it's uh, the quantum information industry, which is booming and they can't hire my students fast enough and the postdocs. Before, there were other, they were gobbled up into other high-tech industries and our CTOs, CEO founders, just all around company technological superstars in, in, in many, many companies. And so it's basically so much of the American economy is driven uh, by that high-tech part and you can't, it's not like specific training to a particular uh, industrial need, which is a fine thing to do. It's rather uh, generalized training how to like solve extremely difficult technical problems. And my students who are in industry now are, are mostly doing, and nobody is doing this, right? No anything remotely like this. Um, so it's not the specific skills they learned, it's the sort of overarching, free-swinging technological confidence to, to accomplish things um, that I, I feel like in difficult experiments like this, you do this and you come out with that. So that's kind of the product <laughs> uh, for, uh, for the American consumer, for the American taxpayer. I know that's not exactly the question you asked, but I do get that question sometimes. But I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. And, um, and obviously you thought about it. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and you have the luxury of being able to think about it on somebody else's body, which is great. Yeah, no, it is. At the end of the day, if you are producing good thinkers and smart people, um, that's just about the most important thing you can produce. It's better than this, uh, another cell phone. You've got enough out there cell phone. But really, <laughs> uh, a whole bunch of smart people will eventually take on problems that are uh, unimaginable at this moment. Thank you. So, Thank you. Thanks for making it public. My, my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>um, everything that we see. It turns out that it's very difficult for them to construct an explanation which accounts for the early universe and doesn't also predict uh, these dipole moments. I say difficult, but not impossible. But they have to tie themselves into pretzels to do it. Um, and so that's what's sort of motivating this. It's like, okay, like you might be able to come up with like, you know, some sort of you know, deus ex machina, come down and dial this number down to zero or something like that, but it's not super easy. And so that's the connection. It's not a rigorous connection in the sense that this one theory already explains everything because there are multiple candidate theories. What most of the theories have in common is that they predict both. Um, it's hard because it, these, these two things really are very strongly connected at a theoretical level, but not emphatically connected, I guess is how I'd put it. Yeah. Uh, okay, last one. Okay, hi. Uh, so on your slides, um, I think in the beginning when you're talking about the uh, the, the annihilation of the uh, antimatter and the uh, matter, yeah. um, it seems like it's uh, like the pictures only depict that they only like uh, un start annihilating when it cooled down a bit. Yeah. Um, did I misunderstand? And uh, that, that's oh, correct. Yeah. Uh, why did it happen? Okay. It's not that they don't um, that they don't annihilate when they're hot. It's that when they're very hot, they smash together so hard. Like the the proton, say the proton and the antiproton smashes together, and they have so much energy when they smash together, they could annihilate, or they could actually generate more. Like you can take a proton and antiproton and smash them together and have more than two particles come out. Uh, and so those two things are kind of in, in, in balance, in a, in a statistical mechanical balance. You're sort of balancing the, there's some, uh, basically what you're trying to do is maximize entropy is the way to put it. And as you cool down, um, entropy becomes uh, less important and, and the annihilation becomes more important. So um, at the at high enough densities and high enough temperatures, it's a sort of equilibrium, the, the, the forward and backward going processes are just as likely. And you cool down, then, the, then only the decay problem become, becomes more likely. So yeah, no, it's not like it suddenly turns on like a switch. Um, the annihilation is always there, but it's more like the turning off of the generation of, new, of, of like smashing together and creating more particles. So beforehand, it was like annihilation, smashing, creation. It's like, it's like in the middle of an accelerator, right exactly in the middle of a center where all kinds of stuff is happening. And, and as you cool down and the density, in particular, as the density goes lower, one is favored over the other. So that and it doesn't happen in a second. You know, it happens over what was then 10% of the lifetime of the universe or something like that. <laughs> but I don't know exactly, but something along those days when it sort of went from lots of stuff to little stuff. Um, one more long question. Yeah. Can you, um, uh, basically, does, 
Okay. Uh, does one pair of an, of annihilating um, uh, particle antiparticle pair? Uh, can you can you get multiple like other pairs when when it's hot, or is it like violates uh, conservation laws? Could, could you say it again? Can you get more? Okay. So um, can you get like um, like when 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 they annihilate really hot? Um, can you get multiple other pairs uh, from from the uh, annihilation, or is it uh, does it violate conservation laws? No, it doesn't. I mean, you can you can have a a proton and an antiproton crash together, and in principle, you could have they could annihilate, and then they would release a lot of energy, and out of that energy could come two protons and two antiprotons. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to happen, or a proton, an antiproton, a meson, and an antimeson, or the, the, so all those sorts of things are, are are allowed. The only thing that can't change when they collide together is like the sum of the, uh, call it like the matter-like baryons and the antimatter-like baryons. That, that's, that, that's the number that's conserved as they smash together. Um, but, and the, you could go from one and minus one and get zero, or you could go from one and minus one and get two and minus two. Yeah, that's absolutely possible. And as you get colder, it's more likely to have one and minus one to come together and get zero. And then all that's left is photons. Like the energy has to go somewhere and photons are sort of the candidate for that stuff as the density goes down. Okay. Let's thank you for the fabulous discussion and Eric for an absolutely fantastic lecture.